Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to a special episode of the Strength Coach Podcast, episode 282.5. So, pretty simple here, Gray Cook and Functional Movement Systems have done a six-part series, which really spans over three months. So I wanted to just put all of these segments together as they relate to each other. So uh, that's what we're going to do. This is just basically, we've already done each of these in separate episodes, but I wanted to put them all together. So uh, here is the series that Gray put together. Hey, this is Gray Cook and got a few observations about corrective exercise, the way we fix movement. One of the things that's been rolling around in my head for a few years is should we really be fixing preventable problems the answer is yes help anybody you can whenever you can but by adding new ways to look at the body on top of movement screening everything we can look at with force plates and and heart rate variability and everything like that we've leaned back on things that are unbelievably simple and we've got a simple little breathing screen that we do and we've actually got some breathing resets or some breathing supplements that we do just to recalibrate your breathing pretty quick. We quickly involve that breath into a movement pattern, which is nothing new because both yoga and martial arts don't ever teach movement without the appropriate breath. The best kettlebell and weightlifting instructors have a breath sequence, and believe it or not, your spine likes a breath sequence as well. Flexion likes exhale and extension likes inhale, and there's a lot of biomechanical and physiological reasons for that. But the cool thing is, resyncing breath and movement is not even a movement correction because it's not specific. It's not like we're working on balance to improve balance or working on flexibility to improve flexibility. We're working on breath to reset homeostasis. And that homeostasis reset sometimes reallocates the way we distribute our tension across our body. And sometimes after a hard day, our tension is all in the wrong place. After sitting for two hours, our tension is all in the wrong place. And it's almost made me be critical of all of us in corrective exercise because the new ways we can manipulate those primitive reflexes of the body or the way we use foam rolling or advanced stretching or even soft tissue work to prep ourselves for working out makes me wonder if it's working, why do we have to do it all the time? And so I think our body puts parking brakes on irresponsible things that we do and says, okay, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to make you do it this slow and this inefficient. At least you won't be able to do it enough to hurt us any more than you are doing. And what I want to look at is we've been able to change balance and flexibility just by resetting the breathing. So it makes me think if we've got people living in a toxic environment thinking Red Bull is actually the best supplement for needing to be active longer and sleep less, it ends poorly. So look at all the things we can do in sleep, hydration, nutrition, and breath that will actually change a movement screen in a single day. We've actually got studies right now with the Y balance test in the military looking at uh, sleep deprivation and the way it affects balance. And we don't even need to know how sleep affects fitness because if your balance is out, your fitness is probably good or bad, still going to hurt you because your balance is poor. You're going to fatigue early, be inefficient and less aware. So I guess I want to leave you at this one thought. Ever since we've developed movement screening, we've been able to ask your body a question that your mouth often answers differently. When I ask you what your biggest mobility problem is, sometimes your movement screen tells me something different. And when I ask you what your greatest stability challenge is, sometimes what the movement screen says is exactly the opposite of what you think it is. So we use the movement screen to first and foremost recalibrate your awareness. And if we see something in your lifestyle that is out, Instead of dispensing the corrective for the movement pattern that you have today, what happens if I cut back a runner who has poor form? I cut their mileage back. They've got a one-two leg raise, a, a asymmetrical uh, active uh, leg raise. And I cut their mileage back and all of a sudden, boom, it resets. All I did was protect them from a workout that was too aggressive and too much load under the level of technique that they had. If they're sleep deprived or running at borderline dehydration, we can show how maybe their balance would change just by getting some sleep and hydrating a little bit more responsibly. 
And those are two things right there from the top and bottom where giving a movement corrective would have basically said, movement, don't show me how bad the workout is or how toxic the rest and regeneration is. And so sometimes fixing movement first gives people a Band-Aid when they need to just learn not to scrape their knee anymore. And so I think we can use the movement screen in some cases in wellness situations and even in overloaded or overstressed athletic situations say a little more here, a little less there, movement changes. So if we can use it sometimes as the canary in the coal mine, movement will tell us if we're improving the state of readiness or eroding the state of readiness in our attempts to recondition people. Let's think about that for a few minutes. Last time we talked about what are you actually correcting and sometimes if you throw out the corrective too quickly, you won't realize that sometimes adjusting the lifestyle or workout will actually change the movement screen just because it's inappropriately loaded up top in your workout and in your performance, or it's inappropriately reset in your rest and regeneration practices in your lifestyle. So fixing movement in a toxic environment or overstressed environment may actually allow movement not to tell us what we need to know. And that brings me to a second thing. What is your strategy? Because many of the conversation and debates I've been sucked into over my career in both rehabilitation and fitness have had me talking way more about tactics and strategy. And what I just talked about previously was the strategy of saying, listen, if your wellness is broken, I don't feel obligated to fix your function. I feel obligated to show you how fixing your wellness may have a measurable change in your function. And from whatever that change is, we've got a better base now to attack your function if it's still broken. But we've had a lot of people by just making one change in their workout, their movement screen stabilizes zero corrective. We simply protected them from an irresponsible technique, an irresponsible load, or an irresponsible program that didn't line up with what they thought about the way they moved. Now, remember, in back in the mid-90s, I'm a young strength coach, a young physical therapist. I'm watching my first daughter learn to walk, and I realize I can add nothing. I can only make this situation worse. She's naturally progressing at a self-limiting rate, exploring her environment, trying to get better locomotion and manipulation. That's really all we do with our bodies. As I watched her grow and develop, I realized, ah, she's not going to walk until she crawls good enough to kneel. And she's not going to kneel and stand up unless that lunge or squat will support that. She's earning that stability as she goes through it. So what I started thinking is the strategy of rebuilding movement in rehabilitation should be more about the way the brain uses the body and not just the biomechanical stress we want to apply at the ankle or the knee or the hip and the muscles that run it. If you organize your system through postural elevation, and what I mean is when you're laying flat on the ground, that's a, that's a supported spine. And when you come up into quadruped or plank or crab walk or push up or any other way that you can be on at least one arm and one leg at a time, we call that a suspended spine, somewhat like a hammock between two fixed points, top and bottom. Well, the next way you can use your spine is vertically, but not standing. And that incorporates almost everything from sitting to half kneeling to tall kneeling to low kneeling. And that is a transitional posture. And the last posture is standing. So supported, suspended, stacked, and standing. You don't need to know anything else about neurodevelopmental progression other than you should own a movement pattern through all four of those spine postures. Listen to the way I'm using the language so you don't get confused. I basically am using the word posture to tell me what orientation your spine is. And then I'm using the pattern to tell me where your weight bearing is, where your transition is, and where your landing point is. And in these two things, we've taken everything we know about orthopedics, but put it under the control of the neurological system, combining the two things that impress me most in physical therapy school, the neurological system and the orthopedic system. But I learned those in two different classes and they didn't have that single test that allowed me to know, do I have an ortho problem over here at mobility and stability with a mechanical issue and tissue? Or do I have an inappropriate tone, inhibition, facilitation, trigger point, whatever, largely driven by the neurological system? And if I've got pain, 
I know I got both problems. It's almost impossible to have a unilateral problem. So if you've got pain, all bets are off. It's better to get it diagnosed than try to figure out the next best exercise. It can survive. So the strategy that we've been applying all along is to make sure that we're not trying to fix a functional problem supported by poor wellness. We're not trying to fix a fitness problem that is underpinned by poor function, and we're not trying to improve performance if we've got a major fitness deficit in power or strength or stamina or agility. So we always play the supporting lower thing. And what I've found with a lot of people is we just keep adding strength. What I want to leave you guys with is we all make the mistake and the quicker we see it, the better we are. I did a uh, case study for a um, presentation I did at the World Golf Fitness Summit on an injured golfer. And I talked with Greg Rose about, you know, here at TPI, we've got this great strategy of progressing people. But even then, if we focus too much on golf, we're going to miss a fundamental thing. Please watch that case study and see how we deconstruct that case and resolve the problem, not by being golf experts, but by being movement experts. Hey, this is Greg Cook, and I've been talking about corrective exercise, talking about should we even be correcting things that could be fixed much easier somewhere else, and looking for the cause of what's causing bad movement is a very important part. That's why we use screens. Secondly, I honestly think that we need to have a strategy. Too many times we find a methodology, and whether it be Olympic weightlifting or kettlebells or over in rehab, it's dry needling or some new reflex techniques, we almost turn that into our strategy, and our strategy is not to get us to do our thing, to teach our favorite thing. The strategy should be to either give people more physical independence if they're trying to learn from you, or better physical performance if they're asking you for training, rehabilitation, or whatever. And if you need more of one, you're probably going to have less of the other. You can't be the highest performing person in the world and not be dependent on quite a few more things to keep you at that level. But the more independence you want, the more intelligence and resourcefulness and education you must receive to understand that physical independence. And so I construct a lot of my rehab sessions almost like a learning session because I'm trying to prevent a problem in awareness. See, 81% of the United States right now would rate themselves good or excellent in health. But I'm going to drop some more stats on you. 60% of the U.S. has a uh, chronic, one chronic disease. 40% of the U.S. has at least two chronic diseases. 50% of the United States has musculoskeletal health issues. But 81% of the U.S. thinks they're in good or excellent health. How do you tell somebody who's getting ready to drive drunk that they're getting ready to drive drunk? They usually don't like it. So when you take somebody and find flaws in them, unless you invert that really quick and make it a manageable problem, it's so overwhelming, people go into denial and they will basically form an opinion that's nowhere close to what is correct. This has all made me very, very sensitive to how aware people are about movement problems. And some of the advice that I give people just getting into movement screening and movement assessment is, listen, we built these tests for you, not them. They don't have to learn the terminology and they don't have to know what it means. What you do is take a screen or an assessment or a test and you basically I think constructively ask them, I'm getting ready to give you a balance test. It's called the Y balance test, or it's called the motor control screen. How do you think your balance is? Would you rate it below average, average, or above average? And if the only thing I will tell you is we also not only look for your ability to balance, but also how similar or dissimilar are your attempts on the left and right side. Um, and so if you think you're going to have one side different than the other, please tell me that in advance. And if you think you're going to have a problem or pain, please tell me that in advance. If you think you're the world's best balancer, I'll take that information too. Now, that's their opinion and that's subjective information. And now we go for the truth, which is objective information. And almost any time we go for objectivity, you need to have a test that is considered reliable and you need to be reliable doing that test. 
if I had, uh, I don't have enough fingers to count how many times somebody's done research on the movement screen without ever having proper education or training in how to actually administer the test. Therefore, the results of the test are usually inappropriate because the education and training were applied in a poor way. So are we really evaluating and researching the movement screen or the poor application of somebody who didn't understand a test? That's, that's neither here nor there. But my whole point is, if you're going to evaluate a technique that's moving through you, at least get to a competent level of some degree of proficiency before you realize that you're evaluating the technique, not just your ability to apply it. Having said that, if somebody forecasts their balance is good and we test it as poor, we've got some conflict resolution there, don't we? I got a test that says, well, how would you do that if somebody didn't think they were hypertensive in their blood pressure cuff? There, there are a couple of excuses and reasons, so we can monitor your balance over a few days and see if it fluctuates, just like we would if we were concerned about your blood pressure. We're not going to do a one-test deal, but if you consistently have below average balance and consistently think you do, at some point, as we say in the South, we're going to have a come to Jesus talk because I'm all about communication and accountability. That's where I wound up the, the talk with Stu McGill over at Stanford. Uh, anytime we can enhance our communication and accountability, it's there. Now, those two words roll off my tongue because I've been saying them for a while. But the closer your say is to your do is exactly what this Southern boy is saying. So if you say or think one thing about movement and do another as a coach, as a physical therapist, as a trainer, as an educator, I got to let you know that you ain't seeing what you think you're seeing. And I got to do it just as kindly as if you thought you could read the third line on the eye chart and you're not even close. I've got to give that to you with some grace, but I don't read you your score. I say, you know what? It seems to be, based on the screen we just did, you may have a little bit of a balance issue. Uh, you may have a little bit of a mobility issue. I'm going to put you in a few challenging postures and patterns, and I just want you to work through those. And as you work through them, they're either going to get easier or more difficult. And if they get more difficult, I'm going to have to come in and give you some cues. And if they get easier, the disadvantage of the position I'm putting you in is actually forcing you to do it more correctly than you were doing it the way you chose. So I can put you on a path that's sort of going to sand you down and, and line you up a little bit, or I can cue you the whole time. What do you guys think I'm going to do? Anything that elevates their self-awareness and lets them work through it their self is way better because that's the way my daughter learned to do it. I didn't teach her how to walk. I allowed her a safe environment to explore, and I made sure she got a little bit of challenge when she wanted it. That's what you do with awareness. And so reading somebody their movement screen score or talking to them about what you think about their QL is not movement training. Movement training occurs when they're moving and you're not talking and they're not thinking. They're responding and reacting to weight shift, balance shift, position, and posture change. And if you can improve that awareness, the rest of programming is really simple. We talked about... Uh, different things you can do to get people ready for corrective exercise and make sure your strategy is in check. But ways to elevate awareness are probably the first order of business. And as I said before, it's not about reading somebody their score sheet. It's about putting them in the same challenging positions and patterns that the test revealed they may have difficulty with. And number one, let them work it out their self. Don't over instruct something that should be fundamental. We've already brought it up to this conscious attention. Now put them in the obstacle and let them work through it. And a lot of the new corrective exercises we're doing really push us up against that. We're, we're doing a lot of stuff in balance and actually realizing that, you know, even though we must discuss mobility and stability separately, they usually get better together quicker. And what I mean by that is anything that can sort of demand an inch of length and an ounce of strength at a time is probably going to both gain you the attribute, a little bit more freedom, a little bit more control, but at the same time at a challenge level where you still have to be hyper aware of your limits and realize you're still not as good as you think you are, even though you just got one click better than you were. And so it's that, that razor's edge, that sensory rich environment right up at the edge of your ability is where we really polish and sand movement patterns. But I think a lot of people hear stress. Well, where are the bands? Where are the bells? Where are the bags? 
sometimes it just squeeze balance. The same way you adjust yourself to balance yourself on a narrow beam is how you organize yourself when you pull a deadlift. And so finding alignment prior to a pull or a press or a push is just like finding alignment walking on a balance beam. And so a lot of times when I find athletes that do have balancing problems, YBT, motor control screen, hurdle step, I don't start talking about glute meat or mobility or anything like that. I just basically take them across the room to a balance beam. And I'm like, we're doing 30 laps right now. You're going to walk down, you're going to back up, and I'm just going to smoke them on the balance beam. But I'm not coaching them or yelling at them or anything like that. They're smoking their self because their balance and disorganization reveals their inefficiency. This great athlete with this unbelievable heart and lung engine and these, this great hip drive should not be smoked on a balance beam, which means he's got great power in the slot that he's developed that power. But as soon as he's off balance, most of that power is dampened down just like the governor on a car. Well, what's the very first thing we do with him? Because going in and overcoaching his balance is basically going to create an anxiety situation. He already feels vulnerable and he already feels off balance. That's not a good time to be coaching people. Permission to breathe, permission to breathe. And a good thing is drop your jokes and drop your humor now because laughing and breathing are really similar in that they change the volume of your breath. But getting a little bit more organized on the breath, using some breathing tricks. We've got some new breathing resets we do. Uh, Dr. Wild has a 478 little breath cleanse that he does. You would be amazed at just how clearing the breath does it. That is not me walking beside you on the balance beam telling you how to breathe in your diaphragm and not in your chest. And that's with my exact fear when the fitness industry started really realizing how poor a breathing population we were, we immediately started overcoaching breathing instead of looking for the reason that breathing was compromised in the first place. Sometimes it's driven by psychosocial problems. Sometimes it's a physiological problem. Sometimes it's a respiratory problem. And, and that's why we've gotten into breathing evaluation, because if we're going to reconnect movement and breath the way it was originally intended to be discussed in the first place, uh, yoga, Tai Chi, Indian clubs, any ancient wise teaching of body movement and exercise never pulled apart the breath and the move. And we overcoach the move and then see really poor breathing and then come back in and try to add all these breathing cues. You should have grown those two things together from the very beginning. You should not be overcoaching either one. The breath and the movement come together. And by having ways to screen and test those things, we become more aware because I was doing the same thing. I was over overvaluing movement and undervaluing that breath, that sequence, and that mind-body connection. Well, now that we've got tests that show where your biggest problem is, I can train your breathing to help you with your movement, or I can basically challenge your movement in a certain way and then allow you to breathe easier. The athlete who's having trouble on the balance beam has simply been already planted a few seeds of, hey, Slow down your breathing, but to get the same amount of oxygen, you're going to have to breathe deeper. Drop those shoulders. I, I'm not telling you how fast to go on the balance beam. And if I continuously say two things, slow down and breathe, slow down and breathe, slow down and breathe, they will take ridiculously longer on the balance beam than their athletic pride wants them to, but they won't make a mistake. And that's the self-awareness that we're adjusting because we just gave them a self-awareness thing. But by giving them that breathing command saying, listen, your balance needs to be better and it's not great today. But did you see how much adjustment you made just with your breathing? So bringing a bad attitude to a situation will definitely change that situation. Bringing a bad breath to a good exercise will make that exercise more unnecessary stress instead of more awareness and correction. So when we offer those breathing cues, we don't tell people how to breathe. We've already given them maybe a few little cleansing breaths. We've shown how to breathe a little bit deeper, but basically just to drop tension reinsert those cues when they're moving or under mild stress. And if they can adjust themselves, it will be measurable. How? They won't fall off the balance beam. And if you need to prove that point scientifically, take them back over and do a balance test and it'll probably show you a slight improvement. Well, a couple of responses every day to readjust balance before they start really banging on their body is gonna cause them over time to have a better balance adaptation. And that will be measured in strength and power 
once their posture and their pattern are back in alignment. Athletes with a lot of power and poor balance are basically only going to have that power in a narrow slot. And that's why you're going to see their performance or their durability suffer sometimes because we like to measure power in a clean way. But if they don't have that power 3D and we don't have a test that shows that, then good power test, poor balance pretty much says that. And we've got to hear it. Hey, this is Gray Cook, and I've been talking about corrective exercise and some of the things we need to be aware of. And I'm really going back to the drawing board with a lot of the the ways we can create even more user-friendly correctives. Correctives work, but there there's an art and a skill to some correctives, and some correctives are much more user-friendly, both for trainers with less experience and therapists with less experience and, and, and clients who need to do it themselves sometimes. So we're constantly looking for ways to create these these resets of movement, and we call those corrective exercise. And I started realizing a long time that what our instructors do when they're coaching a single leg deadlift or a half kneeling chopper lift or half Turkish get up or something on a balance beam is they're really running three different lesson plans at the same time. And I memorize these by the ABCs, awareness, breathing, and control. And I've been talking about the awareness that we need to do by putting somebody in a challenging situation, but don't offer them the help. You should have scaled the challenge so they've got to struggle just a little bit. But if they sort of get better as they do it and become more aware of certain things, it accomplished what it needed to do. Once you show them something that they're not too good at, you now have an opportunity to see if you can adjust their breathing simply so they can appreciate simply controlling my state of readiness in my breath gave me a little more mobility or a little more motor control or a little better movement. So that awareness and that breathing need to be set. And now we come to the C, control. And I've been using a half foam roll for a long, long time to do toe touch progressions. Toes up, touch your toes, toes down, touch your toes. And we start doing different combinations of that, simply changing the earth under you by biasing you in plantar flexion or dorsiflexion. But when we go up the kinetic chain, that's what we call a perturbation. It's going to throw you off balance and cause you to react, okay? Your unconscious reactions to stay upright and maintain balance and stuff will override anything I tell you to do. Well, we got a big old redneck here telling you to touch your toes, but for the first time in your life, you're standing uphill. How am I going to work this out? Well, your body's not going to let you fall, but your pride wants you to touch your toes. And I slow you down right there. And I said, listen, man, permission to cheat, bend your knees, keep your feet together. Uh, Do me a favor exhale as you're going down. Now we could do other things like overpressurize and everything, but if I can get you to your toes with a, Hey man, take it easy, relax, cheat, bend your knees and exhale. And you're there. Then all I'll say is now when you come stand up, you're going to lose your balance probably. So make sure you do it slow and controlled. And why don't we do it on an inhale? That inhale will actually create intra-abdominal pressure and keep you from hyperextending in any one part of your back because you've got a big old belly full of air. And it's like trying to dent a stability ball. It's going to offer us some stability. So inhale on the way up, exhale on the way down. But the whole time, we've already got the awareness of what the problem was. We've already offered some breathing cues and sequence. And now the only obstacle they've got is toes up, toes down, or some variation of that. And as Ryan Holiday says in his book, the obstacle is the way. The obstacle's already there. Trainer, therapist, chiropractor, strength coach, get the hell out of the way. You're sitting there saying, slow down and breathe, slow down and breathe. Find your center, find your center, slow down and breathe. So a lot of people have a broken breath sequence. A lot of people rush when they're off balance. The broken breath sequence is a compounding problem. It gets worse the more you do. And people who start rushing when they're off balance usually end up falling. So those two cues force them into more postural motor control and a more synced breath at the same time. And it's absolutely so simple that I think most of us feel we have a hard time charging people to give them something that simple. But it's not. You set up an awareness in breathing situation that allowed this control to happen. Now, here's how you play the trick. Go back to the movement screen 
or balance test that sent you down this path, that sent you down this little challenge and do an immediate retest, that test retest. Because when we're working corrective exercise, you're going for response, not adaptation. There's no time for set principle to occur here. All we're doing is tweaking the app of toe touch or tweaking the app of squat, tweaking the app of balance. And in doing that, you're making adjustments to the brain and to the person's awareness and the way they're going to breathe when they start feeling stress and tension. Now, what do most athletes do? What do most patients do? Most clients do when they feel stress and tension? They immediately tighten up. They immediately basically fight that or resist that with their body. What if we remove that signal and said, cleanse that breath, start again. You can stop any set. The minute a bad rep occurs, I would rather blow the whole set than try to spend four reps getting back on track. So awareness, breathing, and control sets you up for the next in the ABCs. And I want to talk about development next time. Hey, this is Greg Cook, and I've been sort of working my way through sort of a unique concept that I've been talking about on the Perform Better circuit and in a little bit in some of my lectures about taking corrective exercise down to awareness, breathing, and control, the ABCs. Well, a D comes after C, and that's where we get into development, and I think that's where the problem started all along. Back in the 70s and 80s, we had these great development strategies to make people bigger, faster, and stronger, but at the exact same time, we were working with a less physically aware population since I think probably the 50s and 60s. Most of our tests on military and kids show us that we were becoming less physically present and aware and capable as far back as the mid 50s in school kids compared to the rest of the world. Now, if you want to see more about that, I've, I've done a couple of talks called Common Sense Approach to Movement and a Common Sense Approach to Changing Movement. I put those up on the FMS website, and there's simply better ways to talk about movement and how we got lost, because I'm telling you guys, exercise and exercise programming ain't going to fix what's wrong. Most people don't know what's wrong. 81% of the United States doesn't, doesn't get 30 minutes of activity or exercise a day, excuse me, 90% and 81 think they're in good or excellent health. People don't know they have the problems they do. And until they're hospitalized or in a clinic somewhere, they really won't admit they're not healthy, even though the number one correlation with mus most musculoskeletal problems that we see is body mass index. And I know most people don't like that test, but let's be honest. If, if you're living a lifestyle that has you overweight or obese, you're probably living a movement lifestyle that's going to compound your problems with poor rest and regeneration and greater stress on certain body parts and zero stress on others. And that's not a balanced way to do it. Well, we're talking about development now. If we had been developing people more functionally, and I think this was maybe some of the things that guys like Vern Gambetta and Gary Gray were talking, trying to talk about. It's like, you know, you can't build an athlete in the weight room. You can definitely support an athlete in the weight room and you can fix a gap or a hole or a fitness flaw in the weight room. But at some time they need to get on the on the turf or on the floor or back into the environment and pull all these things back together, these attributes together. And that's where I think we we hypothesize, well, this activity uses this muscle in real life, so we're going to basically go over on this bench and hyper-train this muscle and just assume it will integrate itself back in. Well, what if you had a concert a symphony and you pulled four of those people out of that symphony and trained them completely different than the rest of the symphony? The music's not going to be as good. You may have a few standouts or a really impressive one thing over here, but the harmony is what functions is. And I think the, the guys who are seeing athletes sort of be bigger and stronger in a few tests and less agile and less adaptable and really less, less proficient when it came to body awareness as we started having problems. So we started trying to say we need more functional programming. Well, by that time, it was too late. The functional appreciation wasn't growing as quick as equipment that allowed you to isolate stuff, not integrate stuff. And we thought if we just isolated enough that everybody would just spontaneously put it back together on game day. It didn't work that way. So the one thing I'm seeing in athletic development is a lack of balance. We seek that sport specific attribute or that one test. And it's very disappointing because we've seen the military change tests. I think the army's got a new test now. And 
I'm not a big fan of putting a weightlifting test in a general fitness test, especially for somebody who's going into tactical situations, because it assumes that everybody is deadlifting. And believe it or not, I think deadlifts would be a great fundamental thing to teach everybody. But if it's going to be a training tool, I wouldn't make it the test. And we can't help ourselves. Every time a new test comes out, we practice the test instead of seeking the attribute that the test simply wants to identify. You shouldn't train to the test. You should train far beyond the test. And if we've got people flunking their deadlift test in the army right now, my whole point is they do need a minimum level of competency, the deadlift, but three days a week, I'm going to have you doing some type of carry. And before you know it, you'll have the minimum deadlift you need, but you will also be a completely better person all around. So I think you'll carry a pack better. I think you'll run better. I think you'll own your alignment dynamically a little bit better. I think you'll learn how to basically uh, rest under load. And there's everything I can teach you in a light and heavy carry that will basically improve your deadlift. But improving your deadlift in three sets of 10 reps or getting your 50 pound improvement in deadlift, I don't think will make you a better 10 mile hiker directly. I think the carry would be a much better way to do that, but nobody asked me, so it's not that big a deal. My point is any time you have a fitness test, if you aim to do well in that test, you will, but you will create side effects and you may not actually cover the attribute the test was meant to demonstrate in the first place. And nobody cares what your test scores are when you lose or finish last. They just don't care. So we need to train people and not necessarily practice the test. It's disappointing to me when I see people practice the movement screen because great athletes are not challenged by the movement screen that don't have mobility and stability problems. It's not a overambitious test. And the, the simple fact of the matter is if you give me nine different symbols for numbers, I can make any number in the world as big as you want. And if you give me a certain amount of postures and patterns of the body, then I know if you can cover these with excellence, there's nothing or no shape you can't get your body into. Now, you mean you train up a skill or a physical attribute, but your mobility and stability can cover the demands of what you're doing. When you can't cover certain moves in the movement screen, we already know there are things you're going to do differently, like you can only get but so low because of X, or you can only move so quickly because of Y. So, when we get into development strategy, I need you to realize one thing. A failure in one attribute cannot be outplayed in many cases by a superlative in another attribute. So we basically have a non-failure strategy. We do some wellness screens, some health screens, okay, for risk factors. And if you've got risk factors for injury, that trumps any other agenda you have because there's a good chance if you've got enough risk factors for injury, you're not even going to be here in a month. So this needs to be a priority. And it's almost an asymmetrical effect. Your wellness, your rest, your re regen, your life cycles are most important. Next, and if you've got those, at least manage as best as you can, minimum effective dose, we go up into your patterns. Can you organize and move your body into different shapes and combinations with unison and harmony in an effective way above a standard? That's movement screening. There's no physical load. Boom, go up a level. You're into capacities now. Do you have any holes in the way you organize your energy system? System, movement control, postural control, explosive control, impact control. Yes, we could do more tests, but these four show me exactly that you organize really well for carries and really poorly for power. So I realize I don't have to strength train you near as much as I have to tell you how to get more comfortable with being quick. Okay. And on that, we start to build power. And so keeping the balance and having a non-failure uh, fixed is way better than having a personal best on a test. And so the only people I want shooting for PRs have no holes in anything else. And therefore, we're allocating our time and energy, the two precious resources of working out to the weakest link in the system. And if you're training anything else, you probably ain't making a difference. So as we get through the awareness, breathing, and control, and we're back to development, the one thing we don't want to do is see that problem 
that we corrected come back. And it's not because we're going to continue to do the corrective for life. It's we're going to advance that corrective into a balanced development and make sure that's a cornerstone. It was a crack. We're going to replace it with a cornerstone. This is never going to be a problem again. We'll have another one somewhere else, but this isn't going to be a problem again because we're not going to back squat with you anymore. We're going to front squat with you. Remember that warm up. Remember if you've got that asymmetrical single leg deadlift, we're not squatting today because that means your hips are asymmetrical. Lesson learned, got it, everything else should be good. And so using development not to seek a PR or one test, but to demonstrate I'm balanced and I'm covering my marks, I think is a much better thing uh, to associate development with than a superlative or a sports specific maneuver. All right, corrective exercise all the way back to the development. That's what I've been working on. Thanks, guys.